the air with breaking news out of Alabama with new protections just passed for women who want to use IVF to start a family. A major development after that controversial court ruling saying embryos are children. We'll talk about the implications beyond just that state in just a minute. Plus, right now, a dramatic split screen on the southern border. President Biden and former President Trump both in Texas as we speak, both with their own spin on the issue Americans say they care most about, immigration. We'll take you live to the border. We're also live at the Pentagon after some spicy takes about how the defense secretary handled his cancer treatments. One lawmaker suggesting the secretary might be irrelevant. We'll tell you how Lloyd Austin is responding now. Plus, a story that's probably setting your group chats on fire. Where is Kate Middleton? The princess hasn't been seen for months since her surgery. The palace, pretty quiet about it all until today. More on what they're saying. Then in tonight's backstory, a behind the scenes look at what went into uncovering the rise of young girl influencers managed by their parents and followed by creeps. And in the breakdown, a day like no other. Why exactly we're getting a bonus 24 hours today? Later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and we start tonight with that breaking news out of Alabama, where Republicans there have taken some of the final steps to protect IVF procedures. After that bombshell ruling from the Alabama Supreme Court saying embryos are considered children, a ruling, remember, that basically paralyzed a lot of in vitro procedures across the state. You saw that chilling effect with multiple clinics and healthcare facilities pressing pause and chaos for people trying to start families there. Now, two new bills have just passed both chambers looking to give immunity in certain instances related to IVF. So the next steps, some procedural things to combine both of these plans. The governor will have to sign it into law, all of which is expected to happen as soon as next week. I want to bring in Laura Jarrett for more. And Laura, not the final steps yet, but we are getting closer to those final steps after this absolute national firestorm from this court ruling. And now Republicans acting very quickly to try to get a lid on it. Yeah, within almost a week, Hallie, they've yeah. now moved to basically have similar, almost mirror images of each other, both the House and the Senate, um, coming up with these solutions to essentially immunize the clinics. Because remember, that's what their their aim is, to make sure that IVF can resume, to get those procedures restarted, because they're, they're on hold right now, worried about the legal liability that would come from damaging or destroying an embryo, a frozen embryo. And so they've passed similar bills that essentially say no action, suit, or criminal prosecution can result from the damage of that embryo. So it sort of tries to address, and I think they recognize this is sort of a temporary Band-Aid fix to the immunity question for the clinics. But what it doesn't answer, Hallie, is the harder question, which is, when does life begin? Are frozen embryos children? Because if frozen embryos are, in fact, children, as the highest court in the state of Alabama has said, then you can't just destroy them. And that's what the court sort of was teasing out and what led to, again, all of this turmoil. These bills don't answer that harder question, Hallie. And when you call it a temporary Band-Aid fix, Laura, how temp what does that mean? How temporary is it? In other words, are we looking at this to patch things up for IVF patients in Alabama for months, for years, for how I long? I think the lawmakers realize this This maybe gets them through a couple months to be at least, at least get IV, IVF restarted. But even in sort of the heated debate that went on today, everyone seems to recognize, again, there's a, a, a longer-term solution and, and a certain, a certainly some legislation that needs to go a little bit deeper than this. But what they just hope is that at least the clinics will restart and the shipping companies will restart because that's what's causing all of the outcry right now is people literally can't get procedures when they were in the middle of, a, you know, about to do an embryo transfer. Laura Jarrett uh, covering all this for us tonight. Laura, thank you so much. Appreciate Anytime. it. We have some other developing news with a split screen on the border because for the first time this year, we're seeing President Biden and former President Trump basically head to head on the issue that Americans say they care most about right now, immigration. These two top candidates, 300 miles apart, one in Brownsville, that's President Biden, one in Eagle Pass, that's Donald Trump. This is only the second time that President Biden has visited the border, his first stop there in more than a year. And in just the last 10 minutes, he is telling Donald Trump to get behind his border bill. Instead of playing politics with the issue, why don't we just get together and get it done? Let's remember who the heck we work for. We work for the American people, not the Democratic Party, the Republican Party. We work for the American people. Mr. Trump squarely putting the crisis at the president's feet on an issue that he feels like he owns. He's comparing it to this country being at war. The United States is being overrun by the Biden migrant crime. It's a new form of uh, vicious violation to our country. 
So here is the gut check on where things actually stand. It is true, based on Border Patrol data, that border encounters are up. You see the split from the Trump to the Biden administration. It is also true that Republicans, with Mr. Trump's blessing, blocked a bipartisan border bill backed by the White House that would have added a lot of resources people working on the border say they need. The whole thing, though, listen, people are really frustrated about this. Look at this. When people talk about the most important problems facing the country now, according to Gallup, it's not the economy in general. It's not inflation. It's not government generally. It is immigration. Look at that. The top issue for folks. And the person that they say they trust more, Donald Trump, by a pretty big margin over President Biden. Dasha Burns is live for us in Eagle Pass, Texas. So those are the messages that we're getting from President Biden, from former President Trump. What about the people who are grappling with this humanitarian crisis every day? Well, look, Holly, I spent a lot of time talking to folks at the border, and you have this split, right? You have the migrants themselves, who, let's remember, these are human beings, and the vast majority of people I've talked to have, uh, have come across the border have fled desperate circumstances, often threats on their lives, on their children's lives. But then you have the communities that are living on the border, ranchers, farmers, just citizens and residents in this area who are uh, incredibly frustrated and who say they have seen a change. You know, so many of these people have been under Democratic presidents, Republican presidents across the board. This has been a, a long time entrenched issue, uh, but they are feeling fed up. Take a listen. The, the last administration had policies in place. While some may have not liked it, they, they worked. They, they were very effective for us as Border Patrol agents in securing the border. Um, we went ahead and changed everything and didn't have anything in place to, to, to handle the overflow, and, and that's where we're at now. And now there's also frustration, not just in the border regions, but also in some Democratic cities and some blue states where uh, oftentimes Governor Abbott, for example, and, and other governors like Governor DeSantis have flown and bust migrants to, to those cities that are now also overwhelmed and trying to figure out how to handle this humanely, but they feel like there's not quite enough being done at the federal level, Hallie. Former President Trump also said that he spoke with the family of Lakin Riley and viewers of our show, people yeah. who are engaged in the news know that that's the University of Georgia nursing student who was killed allegedly by an undocumented immigrant. I want to play that. Joe Biden will never say Lake and Riley's name, but we will say it and we will remember. We're not going to forget her. Again, saying that he spoke with her family just yesterday. She, in many ways now, Dasha, is uh, has become a symbol yeah. after her death for some Republicans who are placing the blame on Democrats here. That's another dynamic at play. That's exactly right. And look, former President Trump has used stories like Riley's to uh, point the finger at, at President Biden. But I got to point out some important reporting that was done by our colleagues, Olympia Sonier and Garrett Haig. They did an analysis of what Trump calls this migrant crime wave and found that th that really doesn't quite exist. They found that in states that have taken in the most migrants, that crime has actually dropped in those areas. So while any life lost, of course, is incredibly tragic, the, the big sort of scary pattern that Trump is trying to paint, the data doesn't necessarily uh, bear that out, Hallie. It's also important, and we talked about it a little at the top of this discussion, Dasha, but it's like we Americans care. I mean, Americans really care yeah. about this issue, and this cuts across the political spectrum, too. More than 80 percent of Americans say illegal immigration is a serious problem, and for the first time, a majority of those polled back a border wall. These are real headwinds here for President Biden. Yeah. Absolutely. And the electorate we've seen in polling over the last couple of years move to the right on this issue. And we're not just talking Republicans. We're also talking Democrats that have moved more center right and have started to really care a lot more about this issue. And that's exactly what former President Trump wants to capitalize on. And he's seen the same polling we've seen, Hallie. Look, despite the fact that he was a major reason why that bipartisan border uh, negotiation failed, he still polling uh, far ahead of Biden when it comes, when we ask the question of who's who's better capable of handling the border, President Trump beats Biden by a long shot. So the majority of Americans still looking to former President Trump and to Republicans, despite all of what we've seen fall apart on the Hill, they're still looking to uh, that party as the better party on, on this issue, Hallie. Dasha Burns, live for us there in Eagle Pass. Dasha, thank you very much for being there. I know we'll talk again throughout the night. Appreciate it. So listen, back here to Washington, do you remember when the defense secretary was treated for prostate cancer, hospitalized, and nobody knew about it for a couple of days? Lawmakers were furious then, and they are furious today.
pushing back on the secretary as he's in front of them for a hearing that got real spicy. Watch some of this. Are you surprised the president didn't call for your resignation? I'm surprised, but are you surprised that he didn't call for your resignation? The president has expressed, expressed full faith and confidence in me. The big issue for me here is either the president is that aloof or you are irrelevant. Which one is it, Mr. Secretary? That, you would go three, that the president would go three days without knowing that his secretary of defense is, is not on the job? It's neither. It's neither, he said. Remember, the secretary of defense is now in and out of treatment, facing a lot of questions about his un, how his undisclosed absence, and you see the timeline there, could have affected national security. Remember, the White House was told Austin was hospitalized on January 4th. That's the day that's circled there, but he actually went into the hospital three days earlier on New Year's Day. I want to bring in Courtney Kuby, our Pentagon correspondent. Okay, so this is the hearing. Courtney, I feel like the second that we learned about all of this with Lloyd Austin, the question was, boy, when the House hauls him in, right, it's going to be, we're going to see fireworks. That is exactly what we saw. What could actually come of this as the House is looking into what happened here with Secretary Austin? So the reality is there were Republicans who were also calling for accountability here, but at this point, I don't see any scenario in which there actually is accountability. The, the only thing that's less left to do is the Department of Defense Inspector General still has a review or investigation that's ongoing, but that is not likely to yield any accountability either, Hallie. So what we've seen this week is the DOD released a summary of their classified review into this entire hospitalization, secretive hospitalization, um, and, and more looking at the procedures and the notification um, how that was handled by secretary's staff and how it should have been handled. And there's some new guidelines and policies that will go into place, some of them which are already being followed right now, out of that review. But we know very little more detail about what actually occurred on January 1st and throughout that week until we were told here in the press corps on Friday, January 5th, of the secretary's hospitalization. And then remember, it was still days after that before we even found out why he was hospitalized or that he had, had been diagnosed with prostate cancer more than a month earlier. So um, today's hearing, though, we didn't learn a whole lot of new detail about the timeline. But one thing that I found really fascinating from today, Hallie, is for the first time we heard Secretary Austin say on at least two different occasions that he expected his staff would handle the notifications. He said that he believed that he was a patient and that his staff would notify the appropriate agencies of his hospitalization, he even pointed out at one point, Hallie, that he didn't even have a phone and that he was the patient in the hospital. Mm -hmm. But that being said, we still heard from him over and over that he assumes responsibility and accountability because of being the head of the Pentagon here, Hallie. The, the key part of the questioning, and you heard it in that line of questioning that we played from Congressman Banks there, is could, could his absence have affected the chain of command, national security, uh, the issues that the military has to deal with all the time? Because this is Congress and because it, politics is at play, you saw some Democrats coming to the secretary's defense. Let me play that. We were doing everything that we needed to do to meet the national security needs of this country. And if members of this committee incorrectly imply otherwise, they are merely giving aid and comfort to those adversaries that they claim to care about confronting. So give us a reality check on that front, the national security piece of it. So we have heard over and over, including today from Secretary Austin, that there was no lapse in the command and control, that as soon as it was clear that he didn't have the ability to communicate with his staff in a way that he would need to as a Secretary of Defense, then his powers, his authorities were transferred to his Deputy Secretary Hicks. But look, Hallie, the reality is we don't have a very specific, I mean, I'm talking hour by hour timeline of what happened mm -hmm. from the time Secretary Austin was taken by ambulance to Walter Reed on the evening of January 1st until he transfers his authorities sometime the next day, we think in the afternoon, to Secretary Hicks. So, yes, they can tell us that there was no lapse in the command and control, but w w i, I got to tell you, without that finite detail, I don't know how we can confidently say that is true beyond the fact that they're telling mm. us that, Hallie. That's super interesting. Courtney QB, lots more to come on this one. Thank you very much for that. Got to show you this wild scene out tonight in Texas where... The biggest wildfire in that state's history is ripping through the panhandle. But look at this. Snow on the ground. Snow falling on some of these burnt out buildings, burnt out cars. A total 180 from the heat that helped fuel this fire as that has now become deadly. You got crews trying to take advantage of some of this cooler weather, a little bit less wind to try to get some control. 
people are now starting to return to their homes to see what, if anything, is left. And for some people, the answer is just not much. We basically have lost everything. This is the only pair of pants I've got. And the shirt, that's it. I want to bring in Guad Venegas, who is live for us out in Texas where this is all happening. And Guad, it is so incongruous. It's almost tough for, for to comprehend that there is this massive wildfire that is destroying people's lives. And at the same time, you've got snow falling on the ground. How does that happen? Hallie, it's the weather in the panhandle. I've been speaking with authorities and they said that's exactly what causes a lot of these fires because it's windy, the weather changes a lot, the conditions go from cold to hot to windy to not windy. Uh, just minutes ago, we were down the road, it was raining. Earlier today, we were in French, Texas, where it was snowing, we've seen ice. So uh, those conditions are gonna help the crews that are fighting these fires, right? But, uh, you know, when I asked the public information officer how that is going to help, he said to me, well, you got to keep something in mind. These fires burn for so long and they burn so hot that it would take days of rain for that to be put out. You see this hill behind me earlier. We were down there when it was raining and we saw uh, some of those logs, some of those trees still burning with some smoke coming up as the rain was coming mm. down. The public information officer telling me it's parts like that that will remain hot even with the rain. It's still cold, but now it has stopped raining. And you talk about the destruction. I want to show you, this is uh, one of the houses here in, in Canadian Texas, and this is what's left of some of these homes um, after the fire came through. It, it, it only took minutes, the owner told me, from the moment where they saw the flames down at the bottom of the hill and when they had to evacuate, uh, seen the fire coming up to this area. So the weather will help, but they do expect the conditions to change. Uh, the temperature is supposed to rise, and we do expect more windy conditions, which will complicate uh, things for the fire crews, Hallie. We know that already one woman has been killed in this fire, which, again, the biggest one that Texas has ever seen. The scary thing here is that officials say they haven't even started searching some of the spots uh, where they need to get into. That's correct. So we have a four major wildfires that are still burning in Texas. One of those is the largest one in the state's history, right? The Smokehouse Creek fire that has burned more than a million acres, just that fire alone. Uh, so unfortunately, we have a report of one person that died in that fire. She's been identified as Joyce Blakenship. Earlier today, uh, we were able to speak to her son, Paul, who said this about losing his mother. She was a good mother. She always took care of us, made sure we were fed and had everything we needed. We also know uh, that Joyce was a former substitute teacher, an 83-year-old grandmother um, that has died as a result of these wildfires. And meanwhile, Hallie, there's a lot of people in these communities here in Canadian and also in Fritch, where a lot of the houses uh, burned down in one of the communities that are now returning to find this. Uh, but yesterday when we were there, a lot of them were in at an evacuation center and the authorities weren't allowing them to come back to their homes because it wasn't safe. So today they will be returning to find something like what we see here uh, where the house burned down completely, Hallie. Guad Venegas, live for us there in Canadian, Texas. Guad, thank you very much for being on the ground there and bringing us some of those stories. Back here in Washington, you're about to see the moment that the House of Representatives officially kicked a potential government shutdown to another day. On this boat, the A's are 320, the nays are 99. Two-thirds being in the, the affirmative, the rules are suspended, the bill is passed. Let me put that into plain human English for you. This is the House deciding, you know what, actually, we are not going to deal with this today. They're pushing the deadlines again. You see the big X's there on the original deadlines. One of them was tomorrow at midnight. Now we're talking March 8th and March 22nd, when we're going to need to see some kind of a longer-term deal. The House Speaker, Mike Johnson, promising to slash the budget. Look, the appropriation, appropriations process is, is ugly. Democracy is ugly. Um, this is the way it works every year, always has, there will be uh, real cuts to uh, non-defense uh, discretionary spending because that's what was agreed upon and that's what we're going to adhere to. Ryan Nobles is joining us now from Capitol Hill. Okay, so Speaker Johnson has been clear, right? He wants cuts. The question is, even with this delay, is he going to get them? Because we're now on, like, the fifth deadline, the fifth can that the House has kicked since September across two speakers, and those really big, massive cuts, they just haven't happened. 
Yeah, and uh, Hallie, there's no uh, world in which he gets those steep cuts that he's looking for. Uh, this is a bill that has to be agreed to by both Republicans and Democrats if it has any hope uh, of passing through Congress and then getting to the president's desk. And and so, in reality, while perhaps Democrats are not going to get the spending increases that they're looking for, Republicans are certainly not getting the steep cuts that they're looking for. They've already agreed to essentially how much money they plan to spend in totality. So what they're haggling over right now is how to apply that money uh, to the various departments uh, that need to be funded here uh, on, the, on these new two, two deadlines of March 8th and March 22nd. Now, it seems pretty likely that they'll be able to get at least half the government funded by next Friday. That's part of what they're delaying action on right now to give members the opportunity to look at these bills and make sure that they're okay with them. It's that second tranche uh, of bills, the, the biggest departments, the Department of Homeland Security, the Defense Department, uh, and the De State Department. That that's where there could be some disagreements, particularly with conservative Republicans who are really begging Speaker Johnson to try and hold firm, even if it means shutting down the government. That seems something that he's not inclined to do as of yet. Uh, but there is a long period of time between where we are today on Leap Day, uh, Hallie, and March 22nd. And so anything could happen between now and then. We've averted the shutdown for now, uh, but for now is the optimum phrase that we should be pointing to. Just tattoo it onto your forehead, Ryan Nobles. Um, or don't. Thank you so much, Live, for us there on the Hill. Appreciate it. A new investigation tonight into whether cars made in China could be used to spy on Americans. With the Secretary of Commerce tonight arguing these cars have so much technology in them, they're basically like smartphones on wheels that could collect Americans, data, I should say, on Americans. There aren't a lot of cars from China in this country because of big tariffs, but they are a lot cheaper than other electric cars. The U.S. doesn't want them to eventually flood our market here, in the words of President Biden. I want to bring in Andrea Mitchell, who is covering this one for us tonight. So, Andrea, the White House says that this is like a national security issue, potentially. Explain that. Exactly. Well, Gina Raimondo has been warning about this threat, and Commerce Department now has the authority, when they see national security threats in technology, to take action. So she's told me that she can actually ban these cars, the software. They now, uh, they're exploding. They've now passed Tesla. One of, their, one of their sellers is the biggest worldwide seller. They're at 9% of the European market, up to 9% there. Very few sold here, but the software is what's available. And now they're trying to get around the tariff problem by assembling them in Mexico. So I asked Gina Romano, the secretary, you know, with this investigation, which is going to take about two months, and then they'll make the decision, she'll make the decision. I asked her, you know, what is the threat when you get in the car? Here's what she said. Imagine a world in which there are, mil for example, millions of ch cars, Chinese cars on U.S. roads, collecting this data every minute of every day on millions of Americans and sending that back to Beijing. This isn't the, you know, the steel and the wheels. This is the software and the sensors. And so she said they can be operated remotely. So if they were flooding the market, mm. Beijing could remotely stop millions of cars all over American roadways with, you know, with the flip of a switch. That's the national security issue. I said, is this just protectionism? It's an election year. The auto workers, Michigan battleground states. I mean, you know the drill. She said, no, this is not protectionism. This is not doing a favor for the automakers. This is national security. And under national security, she can take the action. So it is not a trade issue. The Chinese foreign ministry says this is a stretch of the interpretation of national security. So. What would a timeline look like on that, Andrew? I mean, you make the important point. It's not like we're seeing these Chinese cars as commonly as we see Teslas on the road, right, outside our offices here. But she, what? Well, she says it's not long term. Okay. It's around the corner. And certainly, uh, according to Phil LeBeau, CNBC's, you know, great auto expert who's down in Chile right now at a, a car sales, a Chinese car sales plant down there. So they are selling all over Latin America yeah. and they can be reassembled in Mexico and sold here without any barrier. But within about two months, two months exactly, she could make this decision yeah. and take some action. Andrea Mitchell, it's just so interesting. We talked yesterday on the show about these connected cars and the potential risks domestically. Here we are talking about the foreign policy impact. We're so glad that you're bringing us that interview with the secretary. Look thank who's you. Who's watching at you while you're driving down the road? There you go. Andrea Mitchell, thank you. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, FBI Director Chris Ray 
Warning, today the country will face more complex threats to elections this year. He says AI and some other technological advances have made it easier for foreign adversaries to target voters. Ray is also suggesting the FBI would share information about threats it sees this year. Number two, a new CDC report says there were an average of 488 deaths every day from too much drinking at the height of the pandemic. That's up nearly 30% from what the numbers were from a couple years ago. The CDC also says that although there were more alcohol-related deaths among men, the increase was bigger for women. Number three, officials say an American Airlines flight going from New York to Spain was forced to land in Boston because of a cracked windshield. That happened, or the alert came in, a couple hours after takeoff, according to police. American says after landing safely, the plane was taken out of service for inspection. Number four, Netflix is probably going to raise prices again this year, according to analysts. The company already boosted the price of its basic plan, $2, so it went from $10 to $12 bucks last October. Netflix itself has not actually confirmed any price hikes yet, but executives have said that's on the table. Number five, late breaking news into us tonight about Caitlin Clark. Guess what? She's taken her talents to the WNBA draft this spring. That's what she's announcing just in the last hour. She's the all-time NCAA women's scorer now. She says, it is fully, it is impossible to fully express my gratitude to those who have supported her basketball journey. The draft is going to happen mid-April after the end of the college basketball season. And boy, she's got a lot of season left in her. We'll see if she breaks the men's scoring record this weekend. Go Caitlin Clark, man. Queen. Speaking of royals, Kensington Palace is now responding to all the speculation over Princess Kate Middleton's absence from the public eye, although short on details here. You have the spokesperson today putting out a statement saying that Kate is doing well and that her team will only provide significant updates in what seems to be a response to the days of growing questions now about where she is. Remember, the palace says she's recovering from a planned abdominal surgery and has said since the beginning that she's not going to come back to the job until after Easter at the end of March. But Kate, arguably one of the most famous people in the world, has not been seen in public since Christmas. And just a couple days ago, her husband, Prince William, pulled out of a memorial service for his godfather at the last minute because of a personal matter. So all of that together, like if you exist on the Internet at all, you have probably seen it. Like some of the guesses, some of the baseless conspiracy theories about where Kate could be, what might have happened to her. Let's bring in Matt Bradley here, who's covering this for us. And Matt, like, listen, any human has any right to, to recover in private. And Kate Middleton certainly has that. But this is one of those instances where the palace, which is sort of notoriously tight-lipped about things relating to the royal, plus no sightings of Kate, has people really wondering what's going on here. Yeah, I mean, Hallie, I mean, one of the really interesting things is that, you know, it was kind of the Internet meme machine that forced this statement from the palace. As you mentioned, you know, nothing has really happened here. The palace hasn't said anything. It was just this rise in memes and conspiracy theories on the Internet and, and jokes, pretty funny ones, to be honest, um, that really pushed the palace in order to actually make this statement. So this is just you know, and you could almost sense it in some of the language of that statement. It was almost a little bit impatient, a little bit annoyed. There was kind of a tone to mm. it. Um, and there was there has been a lot of speculation online. And it's because of the events that you mentioned. But this kind of tit for tat between all of the meme makers on the internet and the palace was pretty interesting. And kind of extraordinary, Matt. I mean, there's plenty of stuff on the internet about the royals all the time. And the palace sure doesn't respond to all of it. <clears throat> No, never complain, never explain. This has their, been their MO for so long. But you know, Hallie, these aren't, you know, these aren't regular royals. These are cool royals. And they aren't really the same mode of, you know, Queen Elizabeth II, who recently died. Of course, she was you know, pretty private about her health. And her father died without anybody in the entire country knowing he had cancer. He didn't even know his diagnosis. So this is kind of a different royal family than all of that, when they used to keep everything super tight. And you're seeing... The big thing now, King Charles, he's going around talking about his own experience with cancer, and he's doing it in such a public way. You know, yeah. you're talking about your uh, the last statement you had on the last story on Oprah Winfrey. It's almost in that mode that we're seeing now, and that's kind of why this silence is so deafening, especially for royal watchers who are used to seeing and hearing from the royals every couple of days. This really is startling because these people are pretty open. Hallie? Matt Bradley, live for us there in London. Matt, thank you very much for that. When we come back, how long an American detained in Russia is going to have to stay behind bars after this ballerina's appeal in Siberia got denied? 
Plus, Gaza health officials say dozens of people were killed while waiting for food, waiting for help. What Israel is now saying about why it happened and the new response from President Biden tonight. New questions tonight after a chaotic attack in northern Gaza with at least 100 people killed, 700 more hurt while waiting for food, according to a spokesperson for Gaza's health ministry. Israeli troops putting out, look at this, some of the aerial video you see here showing the attack and the panic. So what you're looking at, this is people surrounding an aid truck when then gunshots started going off. Back here in Washington, President Biden acknowledging this deadly violence will complicate talks to pause fighting and get those roughly 130 hostages still being held by Hamas and others out. Hope springs eternal. I was on the telephone with the people in the region. I'm still, probably not by Monday, but I'm hopeful. I want to bring in Raf Sanchez, who's live for us in Tel Aviv. And Raf, uh, talk through what we're learning about the attack here, what Israel says about why it happened, and why this is so complicated to begin to untangle. So, Hallie, Israelis and Palestinians giving two very different accounts yeah. of what happened. Here's what we know for sure. Starting at around 4 a.m. this morning, hundreds of Palestinians gathered on Al Rashid Street. This is a coastal road in Gaza City. And they were waiting at an aid distribution point, hoping to get some food, hoping to get some flour. The U.N. says one in four Gazans are just a step away from famine at this point. A Palestinian eyewitness says that Israeli forces at a checkpoint started shooting at that crowd before any of the trucks arrived and then continued shooting later as the crowd surged towards those trucks. As you said, the Palestinian Authority says more than 100 people were killed. Hospitals in northern Gaza flooded with gunshot victims. The Israeli military is telling a different story. They are saying most of the dead were killed in a stampede in the chaos around the trucks. Some of those people may even have been run over by the trucks themselves. And they're saying their forces opened fire only at a very specific group of people who were threateningly approaching their position. Now, I asked an Israeli military spokesman earlier, do you have any evidence to support that claim that your forces were being threatened? Any drone footage, any head cam footage? They said they had nothing to provide at this point. As you heard the president say, he fears, other fears, that this will complicate what were already very difficult ceasefire fire negotiations, negotiations that, Hallie, at this point appear to be basically stalled. If there is any cause for optimism right now, it is that the last ceasefire deal back in November was also negotiated during a period of pretty intense bloodshed in Gaza. That said, this is a much bigger deal. It is a much more complicated deal. And it is not clear right now if the two sides can come together and get it done. Hallie. Raf Sanchez live for us in Tel Aviv. Raf, thank you. To Russia now, where a Siberian court is denying an American ballerina's appeal of her detention on these charges of treasons. Ksenia Karolina wanted the court to replace her detention with house arrest, but they said no, she's going to have to stay behind bars until at least early April. Remember, Karolina has been accused of treason for apparently donating something like $52, $51 to Ukraine and posting messages against the war, according to Russian state media. She faces up to 20 years in prison under Russian law. I want to bring in NBC News chief international correspondent Keir Simmons. You are just hearing now from Carolina's boyfriend. What's he telling you? Yeah, that's right. I mean, this is another uh, depressing example, isn't it, Halley, of uh, an American citizen held uh, in Russia. Uh, Kesnia Karelina learning today that she is going to be held for another month. And I suspect, given the other examples, that it will be longer than that. And that's what her boyfriend, who we spoke to in L.A. In LA today after the decision that her appeal would be rejected, that's what he is having to come to terms with. He's told us about her condition, where she is being held, that, for example, she only is able to shower once a week. Take a listen. And I didn't get my hopes up. I knew this was going to be just like we're going to need a miracle. Um, but I was so sad to know that Cassini has to go back there. And um, that's painful. A $51.80 donation. And I still can't wrap my head around it. I, I can't, it, it. For her to be where she is because of a simple donation, because she's kind, you know, I, I'm battling with it to understand this. And, Hallie, I asked him what his message would be to President Putin, and he said 
She's innocent. She's mm. not a politician, uh, and uh, she doesn't deserve to be to be in prison. And it's happening on the same day as Putin himself is issuing, you know, this this. I don't want to say new warning to the West because it echoes what he's been saying for a long time, right? He wants the West to stay out of the way of his invasion of NATO, uh, his invasion of Ukraine, I should say. Yeah, I, I mean, but it actually comes, uh, Hallie, uh, after President Macron of France suggested in a speech and stunned many people, made many headlines, suggesting that there could be NATO boots on the ground inside Ukraine. Uh, by the way, there's now an argument between Germany and France and the UK after the German Chancellor suggested that there were uh, French and British soldiers in Ukraine already. And then you have President Putin today. And I mean, all of this just underscores, I think, uh, frankly, what diplomatic, what diplomatically is a real mess over Ukraine right now. Uh, you now have President Putin effectively warning of a nuclear war if what President Macron says he thinks might happen did happen. And now we have the State Department weighing in. Take a listen. It is not the first time we have seen irresponsible rhetoric uh, from Vladimir Putin. It is no way for the leader of a nuclear armed state to speak. Uh, we have communicated in the past privately and directly with Russia about the consequences of the use of a nuclear weapon. Um, that said, we do not have any sign that Russia is preparing to use a nuclear weapon, and we will continue to monitor this carefully. And Mali President Putin, in that speech, uh celebrating, if you like, uh, success on the battlefield by the Russians, although, frankly, the front lines have hardly moved uh, in uh, recent months. Uh, and talking about uh, Russian soldiers going through the, this is his words, going through uh, the furnace of war. Remember, once upon a time, he wouldn't even call it a war. Keir Simmons, live for us uh, from London with a lot of news to cover from that region. Keir, thank you. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Western Bureau, you've got California Highway Patrol rescuing a man two days after his car fell, yes, down that cliff. Look at that. So that's the car, and in, in the bottom of the screen, that's the rope they're lowering down, and that's the guy, the rescuer that they're sending down to lift this man up. The driver says it happened when he swerved to avoid hitting a deer. He somehow survived, and amazingly, incredibly, he's expected to be okay. Out of our Northeast Bureau, a car in New Hampshire. Look at that, fully flipping on its side in the drive through of a Duncan. The fire department telling the Eagle Tribune the car accidentally drove onto a concrete-filled metal pipe. Officials say nobody hurt and still no word on whether the driver did, in fact, get their Duncan on time. And out of our Southern Bureau, a baby pig ceremoniously pardoned today after he got tossed around like a football in New Orleans. He had some people throwing him in a park and laughing when a bystander stepped in. The piglet has now been adopted by a state congresswoman. There's Earl. to live out his life on a farm. Coming up. New reporting from the New York Times showing just how dangerous the world of child influencing can be for tweens. We're talking with one of the reporters behind that investigation in our backstory tonight. We've got some breaking news to tell you about coming into us from Annapolis. I want to show you a live picture now, aerials, where apparently the Maryland State House is under lockdown for some kind of security threat. That is according to Maryland's Governor Wes Moore. In a new statement from the governor's press secretary, they say there's really not much more information available at the time, but staff members, personnel, people on the ground should shelter in place and listen to directions from any available member of police or law enforcement. So again, some questions on why there has been this lockdown, apparently, of the Maryland State House in Annapolis. You are looking at the feed coming in here from our local station in Baltimore, Maryland. One of the reporters who works for that station has posted a photograph of police with weapons drawn heading inside the building. We are following this very closely. We are monitoring for any new information or news coming out of here as to why exactly this place is on lockdown. We're going to bring that to you the second that we get it. Time now, too, tonight to get to the backstory, our behind the scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. And tonight, we're looking at a huge investigation from the New York Times about the rise in popularity of younger girl influencers with social media accounts managed by their parents. These accounts also apparently drawing some pedophiles. And the Times says on some of these accounts, parents actively encourage male admirers. They sometimes even sell them pictures, the Times says. 
reporting from the paper that speaks to just how dangerous the world of child influencing can be for tweens. In a time when a third of preteens want to be influencers, they say. We should note that Meta told our team parents or managers are responsible for the accounts and their content and could delete them anytime. The same thing they told The Times. I want to bring in now Jennifer Valentino DeVries, the New York Times reporter with that story. Let's bring in now Jennifer Valentino DeVries, the New York Times reporter with this story. Jen, we're so glad to have you on, especially given the depth of what you've reported here with you and your team looking at thousands of accounts. At one point in this piece, you write that it's showing disturbing insights into how social media is reshaping childhood, especially for girls with direct parental encouragement and involvement. People can see it there on screen. So it's just a huge investigation. So where did the reporting start for you? What was the impetus for this? So unbelievably, this actually started before the pandemic. My colleague wow. on this piece, Michael Keller, and I were looking into um, how social media might be affecting young girls and started doing searches on, on social media platforms of things like tween influencers, you know, to see just how this massive, expanding influencer culture might be trickling down to the younger set. And we were finding all of these accounts that um, were run by parents. I had no idea until we looked at this that there could even be such a thing as a tween influencer. And, you know, we pitched this story and then um, I was just looking at one of our, our pitches and it was in you know January, February of 2020. And I think we all know what happened immediately after that. So um, there was a lot of news intervening in the meantime. And finally, we were able to pick it up again last year and, and look into this because we still felt it was really important. It's incredible to hear how long this was in the works, right? Whether it was front burner or back burner. How did you keep track of all of this? Because there were so many accounts. There were, I know, a lot of interviews, a lot of sort of background you had to gather, all that material. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it was just um, a massive undertaking. We used a lot of... Uh, Google spreadsheets and a lot of file folders on our computers. Um, and, you know, I think that was one of the big tasks we had was just keeping this organized. But it was so important for us to really get the full scope of what was happening rather than just trying to rely on talking with, you know, one or two people. As you talk about these conversations, um, I know you talk to parents who run these accounts, and one of them, one mom told you in a comment that our team really picked up on, um, she said she fed a pack of monsters. That's how she phrased it to you. She said that her daughter has written herself off and decided that the only way she's going to have a future is to make a mint on OnlyFans. She has way more than that to offer. That's a quote there. Was it that kind of thing? Was it a comment like that that surprised you most in the course of your reporting? Or, or was there anything that you reported out that really shocked you about this? You know, I think a lot of this was surprising. And I, I think that was some of it. And she was not at all the only parent who had been doing this for some time who expressed some sort of regret um, for at least part of what had happened and who told us um, that now that they had been through this they did not think that children should be on social media in this way at all um, you know I think that I was surprised that honestly there are still accounts like this being opened all the time you know it was difficult mm. to keep track of just new accounts um, and people coming into this world. And I think a lot of parents think that um, they're going into this and influencer culture is really normalized, especially among Generation Z. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think some people are just really not aware of, of how difficult it is to keep kids safe on these platforms. Well, that brings us to the accountability factor, right? Not just for some of these parents, but these social media companies. And that's a, another huge part of this. Did you find that as you were trying to get answers on that front, that these companies were responsive to this, to the parents, to your questions? You know, I think that um, the largest player here is Meta, um, mm -hmm. because this world that we found is really on Instagram, this particular world, um, partly because that's where the brands are. Um, these kids are really... They're representatives for brands that make things like leotards and children's dance outfits. Um, and those players really want to be on Instagram because that's easier for them. Um, and, you know, I think that when we were talking with these, um, the brands and with Meta, the response was not entirely satisfying. You know, some brands really worked to keep their followers clean but had a hard time, and others, I think, just kind of 
threw their hands in the air and it was just, they found it so difficult. Jennifer Valentina DeVries, thank you so much for giving us a look sort of behind the scenes at what goes into a piece like that, one that I encourage folks to read, of course, on the site. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Lots more to come here on the show, including everything you ever wanted to know, but we're afraid to ask about why today is actually February 29th. In case you haven't noticed, it is Leap Day, and while that may seem like any other ordinary 24 hours, there's actually a lot of science to this, a lot of history. You curious about it? Harry Smith explains in tonight's breakdown why the world would look and feel a whole lot different without it. Yahoo! It's Leap Day, that extra day in February that lands on our calendars once every four years. It means deals on donuts and fast food. It commemorates the life of St. Oswald, who died about a thousand years ago and was famous for building monasteries. We take it you know about the Earth's annual trip around the sun. Takes a year, right? Well, it really takes 365 and one quarter days. And you're starting to think, come on, no one said anything about math. Well, tough. The trip takes 365 days, 5 hours, 48 minutes, and 46 seconds. And if we didn't add a day every four years, then after a half dozen centuries or so, summer would turn into winter, and winter would turn into summer, giving a whole new meaning to Christmas in July. When the ancient Egyptians began measuring time by dividing the year into 12 months of 30 days, they added the five extra days on to the end of the year as five days of festivals. Party on, Pharaoh. But seriously, to be a leap year, the year number must be divisible by four. Easy peasy. But... That 365 day, 5 hour and 48 minutes and 46 seconds times 4 only adds up to an extra 23.2 hours, not a full 24. So what is a world to do as all those leap days pile up? We occasionally take out some leap days. We only get a leap day in end of century years that are divisible by 400. So... For instance, the year 2000 was a leap year, but the year 1900 was not. Got it? Me either. For all you celebrating February 29th as your birthday, you are special. Think of it this way. All the kids you went to school with, kids from your grade, when they turn 100, you'll be 25. Give or take a couple of minutes. Our thanks to Harry Smith for that one. That does it for us for this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. We are coming on the air with a dramatic split screen at the border. President Biden and former President Trump, both in Texas, both with their own take on the issue Americans say they care most about, immigration. We're going to take you live to the border for more on that as we speak. Elsewhere in Texas, snow now covering up some of what has been burned out from one of the state's biggest wildfires ever. How crews are trying to take advantage of this moment tonight before it starts to heat back up, potentially. We'll take you there live. Then, breaking news in just the last half an hour, the National Guardsman accused of leaking thousands of classified documents, changing his plea to guilty. We'll break down why. Also breaking in just the last 30 minutes, the House of Representatives releasing the transcript now from the deposition of President Biden's son, Hunter. Remember that high-profile deposition behind closed doors? We are getting our first glimpse at what was actually said with our team combing through it right now. We're going to have the highlights in just a sec. And Oprah taking a big name off her favorite things list, if you will, stepping back from Weight Watchers after years as their spokesperson. What it means for the company and for Oprah later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and we're starting with that split screen on the border, because for the first time this year, we are seeing President Biden and former President Trump head-to-head -head on the most important issue to Americans right now, immigration. You've got these top two candidates 300 miles apart. You've got President Biden down in Brownsville. You've got former President Trump up in Eagle Pass. It's only the second time that President Biden has visited the border, the first time in more than a year. And in just the last hour or so, he's telling Donald Trump to, hey, Get behind the border bill the president's pitching. Watch. Instead of playing politics with the issue, why don't we just get together and get it done? 
Let's remember who the heck we work for. We work for the American people, not the Democratic Party, the Republican Party. We work for the American people. Mr. Trump, on the other hand, is putting the crisis squarely at President Biden's feet on an issue that he feels like he owns, comparing this moment to the country being at war. The United States is being overrun by the Biden migrant crime. It's a new form of uh, vicious violation to our country. OK, so here's the reality check. It is true, based on Border Patrol data, that border encounters are way up. You can see the numbers here, the split from the Trump administration to the Biden administration. It is also true that Republicans, with the blessing of Mr. Trump, blocked a bipartisan border bill backed by the White House that would have added a bunch of resources that people working on the border on the ground say they need. The whole thing, the whole issue is making Americans feel really frustrated here. And that cuts across party lines. Polls show that the biggest issue the voters say is most important to them. It is not inflation and the economy. It is immigration. And the person they trust more to handle immigration, Donald Trump, by a pretty big margin over President Biden. Dasha Burns is live for us in Eagle Pass, Texas. And Dasha, this split screen moment we've known for a few days has been coming, right? Donald Trump, Joe Biden, both in Texas, hundreds of miles apart. But our White House team, our, our reporting from them, had suggested that a Biden campaign advisor said they really want to try to crystallize for voters the contrast here, that it was Donald Trump and Republicans who killed that bipartisan border bill, Dasha. Yeah, Ali, we have reporting that Biden was really going to be, quote, coming in hot against former President Trump. And that's not exactly what we saw from President Biden today. In fact, he invited a former President Trump to work with him to lobby Congress to pass that bipartisan border bill. But there wasn't that sort of direct and harsh finger pointing that maybe some Democratic strategists wanted uh, to hear from him. Now, uh, his advisors are also telling us that this was not a campaign stop. This was an official white. White House visit, but it is emblematic of how seriously President Biden takes this border issue. But I think the split screen here was not just in sort of their visions for the immigration issue, but also the differences in character where, you know, Biden is a man who has made his political career on his ability to empathize and be sort of that Uncle Joe who can come and understand where people are coming from, whereas former President Trump has made his political career out of being uh, a, a more bombastic, more of that kind of fighter strong man type of character. And we really saw that on display today. Trump saying Biden's destroying the country while Biden's asking Trump to work with him. And then there are the people who are feeling caught in the middle on this, people who say they're trying to find a better life. Yeah. Tell us more about that piece of it. Yeah, right. In these communities all along the, the Texas border and, and other uh, parts of the border in Arizona and California as well, there are the people who are, are living in these communities and then there are the migrants who are coming across. And so often, Hallie, you know, we hear the statistics, the numbers of people coming, but we don't often talk about why. And I want you to hear a conversation between our colleague Gabe Gutierrez and one of the migrants he met today. Take a listen. Why did you come to the United States? For a better life for my son, because in El Salvador, there aren't any opportunities for employment. There's nothing. These folks are often fleeing life threatening situations at the same time. Uh, that's those aren't the only people who are coming across the border. Right. And the people who have been living here have been dealing with this for decades and they are frustrated. Many of them empathize with these situations. Some of them are angry. Uh, but regardless, most of the people you talk to here, wherever they fall on the political spectrum, want more to be done by the federal government. And there's also, as we talk about this sort of fight, it seems, between Texas, specifically the governor there, and the Biden administration oh, on the yeah. national level, you've got this battle with a federal judge blocking a Texas state law that would give new powers to local law enforcement. Talk about the impact on the ground of something like that. Yeah, that Texas law was aimed at giving local police the ability to arrest and detain uh, migrants who they suspected of coming across the border illegally. Now, that court ruling blocked that. Um, but the uh, t t folks in Texas here, especially Governor Abbott, he is digging in his heels, saying that they're going to continue uh, to pursue this because they feel that President Biden uh, is not doing enough. At the same time, the White House is praising this decision. But, Hallie, I got to tell you, Eagle Pass, where I am right now, is actually the epicenter of 
of this fight between federal power and state and local power. Mm. This is the region where Governor Abbott uh, deployed those uh, floating uh, buoys with the razor wire, where he uh, installed razor wire like what you see behind me all across this part of the border and where he's deployed thousands of National Guard troops uh, really using the state power to defend the border when he's saying President Biden isn't doing enough. But, you know, this is protecting the border. It is federal jurisdiction. And, and this clash uh, just keeps going, Hallie. Dasha Burns live for us there in Eagle Pass. Dasha, thank you. Also in Texas, a pretty wild scene in the panhandle, even with the state's biggest fire ever burning through parts of that state. Look at that snow on the ground, snow, a layer of snow covering just burned out houses, burned out frames of cars. It is a total 180 from the heat that helped fuel this wildfire in the first place. You've got crews now trying to take advantage of at least this break in the hot weather to get some control of this fire, as we're just learning now that an 83-year-old grandmother, Joyce Blankenship, died in her home. You see her here. We've got some people now starting to return to their communities to try to see what, if anything, is left. For some folks, the answer, not much. We basically have lost everything. This is the only pair of pants I've got. The shirt, that's it. I want to bring in Guad Venegas, who is live for us in Canadian, Texas, part of the panhandle there. And Guad, it is not unfamiliar to us to see you covering a wildfire. It does feel unfamiliar to see you covering it in a hat and gloves here. This is clearly not California, where they're more used to these massive fires. This is also in a more rural area. What does that mean for things like resources? What does that mean for things like getting crews to where they need to be? Hallie, I've been covering wildfires for about seven years, most of them in California, and this is the first time I cover wildfires with cold conditions and with snow. Uh, this morning, we started our day in Fridge, Texas, where we were watching some of the crews work on some of the hot spots that were still burning in a neighborhood as the snow was coming down. It's incredible. It's a bit surreal, but that's what the weather is like uh, here in the Panhandle in Texas. Officials here tell me that the weather changes all the time. The wind will come from one direction one day, a different direction the next. And that's one of the reasons why these wildfires spread so fast. Now, we do have some good news. It's been announced that more resources are coming in to help the fire crews here. President Biden said they're sending air tankers, small planes and helicopters and also federal firefighters. Now, that, along with the change in temperatures and in weather, is going to help. But there's something to keep in mind. Uh, as I spoke to one of the public information officers, officers earlier today when we were standing under the rain we saw some of these burning hot spots and what he told me is that it would take days of rain for some of these hot spots to stop burning so with the rain is stopping in places like here in canadian some of those could light up again now you mentioned about the properties the homes that have been lost you can see this home behind me completely burned to ashes this is just one of the properties uh, that was caught by the flames uh, here in canadian hallie the scary thing, too, here, Guad, is that because of what you've described, where this fire is spreading, and the fact that people are only starting to be able to return home, we don't even know how bad the destruction is yet. In a lot of these places, and a good example is a fridge, uh, there's a whole community there where the fire already went through, but there's so many hot spots as of this morning, uh, it was still shut down to residents uh, because firefighters don't know if it's safe for them to come back. A lot of people had to evacuate, it, uh, evacuate and they're waiting to see if they can come back because they still don't know if their house burned down or if it's still standing. So because of that, uh, a lot of people are just waiting to see what happens. Meanwhile, the fire keeps spreading. The largest one, right, the Smokehouse Creek fire that's more than a million acres, it's made its way all the way to the border with Oklahoma, and it's about 100 miles or more than 100 miles long all the way on the west side of the state. That's just the magnitude of these wildfires. And also, uh, as you mentioned, we already have one death as a result of that large wildfire, an 83-year-old uh, woman uh, who was a former substitute teacher. Uh, we actually spoke to her son earlier today, and this this is what he had to say. She was a good mother. She always took care of us, made sure we were fed and had everything we needed. 
A difficult day for a lot of people in the panhandle, especially those that lost their homes and that, of course, are going to have a different life uh, moving forward um, as we wait for these weather conditions to change, because I would like to add that it is expected to change over the weekend with right. the winds picking up again, Hallie, which will make uh, work much more difficult for fire crews. Yeah, exactly. That makes fighting this thing so much trickier. Guad Venegas live for us there in Canadian, Texas. Guad, thank you. Let's take you over to Alabama now with some developing news late tonight because Republicans there have taken some of the final steps to protect IVF procedures in that state. After the bombshell ruling from the Alabama Supreme Court saying embryos should be considered children, a ruling that essentially paralyzed a lot of in vitro procedures across the state with a chilling effect. You saw multiple clinics, multiple health care facilities pressing pause on IVF for now which created chaos for some folks trying to start families. Now, these new bills, you see them here, that have just passed both chambers look to give immunity in certain circumstances related to IVF. So the next steps, some procedural things to combine both of these plans, and then the governor will have to sign it into law, all of which is expected to happen as soon as next week. Let's bring in Laura Jarrett now for more. And Laura, not the final steps yet, but we are getting closer to those final steps after this absolute national firestorm from this court ruling and now Republicans acting very quickly to try to get a lid on it. Yeah, within almost a week, Hallie, they've yeah. now moved to basically have similar, almost mirror images of each other, both the House and the Senate, um, coming up with these solutions to essentially immunize the clinics. Because be, remember, that's what their, their aim is, to make sure that IVF can resume, to get those procedures restarted, because they're, they're on hold right now, worried about the legal liability that would come from damaging or destroying an embryo, a frozen embryo. And so they've passed similar bills that essentially say no action, suit, or criminal prosecution can result from the damage of that embryo. So it sort of tries to address, and I think they recognize this is sort of a temporary Band-Aid fix to the immunity question for the clinics. But what it doesn't answer, Hallie, is the harder question, which is, when does life begin? Are frozen embryos children? Because if frozen embryos are, in fact, children, as the highest court in the state of Alabama has said, then you can't just destroy them. And that's what the court sort of was teasing out and what led to, again, all of this turmoil. These bills don't answer that harder question, Hallie. And when you call it a temporary Band-Aid fix, Laura, how temp what does that mean? How temporary is it? In other words, are we looking at this to patch things up for IVF patients in Alabama for months, for years, for how long? I, I think the lawmakers realize this This maybe gets them through a couple months to be at least, at least get IV, IVF restarted. But even in sort of the heated debate that went on today, everyone seems to recognize, again, there's a, a, a longer-term solution and, and a certain, certainly some legislation that needs to go a little bit deeper than this. But what they just hope is that at least the clinics will restart and the shipping companies will restart because that's what's causing all of the outcry right now is people literally can't get procedures when they were in the middle of, a, you know, about to do an embryo transfer. Laura Jarrett uh, covering all this for us tonight. Laura, thank you so much. Got to get to some other breaking news into us tonight with prosecutors signaling that the National Guardsman accused of leaking thousands of classified documents is expected to change his plea to guilty. Do you remember this case? Jack Teixeira. He's expected back in court Monday for a plea hearing. You probably remember, if you don't recognize him here, you probably remember this video. Remember that very dramatic video aerials of his arrest after a whole bunch of Pentagon documents ended up over on Discord. Tom Winter is joining us now. What's happening tonight? Why might he be deciding to go for a guilty plea here? Right. So assistant U.S. attorney Nadine Pellegrini, who is a really a high profile prosecutor in the Boston U.S. attorney's office, she was in charge of or, or helped uh, with the Johar Sarnayev prosecution. She filed a motion late today, Hallie, that effectively says that it is with the agreement of Jack Teixeira uh, that he wants to uh, plead guilty or change or enter a plea of no contest. Um, that's usually not what happens. It's usually a guilty plea and that that could happen as soon as Monday. As you said, Hallie, thousands of documents all all put out online in a chat group or a chat forum called Discord. Uh, they were top secret, secret, specially compartmentalized information, SCI level documents. That's some really sensitive stuff. And it was from Russia and Ukraine. There were also some information uh, that was put out there uh, at the time, uh, detailed to intelligence gathering capabilities involving South Korea and Israel. So we're not exactly talking about what the uh, uh, French uh, prime minister had for lunch. This is pretty serious stuff. Yeah. And 
if you may remember, shortly after this arrest, and you're looking at video from it last April, it was mid-May, and in, in this arrest being made by FBI SWAT back then, it was mid-May when a judge agreed uh, that he posed a serious flight risk and has ordered him detained uh, throughout the entirety of the time waiting up uh, to this potential trial, which now, apparently, Hallie, uh, once the judge agrees to this hearing, uh, will not happen and will result in what appears to be a guilty plea. Tom Winter, thank you very much. Got it. And in a night of more breaking news here in the 6 o'clock hour, come out of Capitol Hill in the last hour or so, the transcript from Hunter Biden's hours-long closed-door meeting with lawmakers just 24 hours ago. Such a high-profile moment with the president's son, there he is, showing up on the Hill after Republicans in the House of Representatives asked him to answer some questions because of the inquiry that they're launching into his dad, the president. We heard, heard a lot about what happened from people inside the room. Now there's a reality check from the actual words spoken from these documents. Ryan Nobles is on Capitol Hill for us. He's been digging through this over the course of the last 20 minutes since we've received it. We're hearing from Hunter Biden's team that they're glad. Um, it sounded like they said they wanted a quick and full release of the transcript. That is what we are seeing now today. Ryan, what are we learning from it? Yeah, first off, this is pretty remarkable that they were able to turn the transcript yeah, of this deposition around so fast. Uh, in general, both uh, legal teams uh, need the opportunity to go through it to make sure that every uh, sentence is accurate, every period is in the right place, every punctuation is appropriate. So it's it's not an easy task. The the, the transcript is over 200 pages, uh, and it you know haven't obviously read the entire thing, but uh, we have a team reading through it right now. And and my general sense from just skimming through it uh, here in the last 25 minutes or so is that this is largely what we expected. Uh, this is uh, members of the committee pestering uh, Hunter Biden about his business interactions, asking him very specific questions about what they would deem to be suspicious business transactions that Hunter Biden was a part of, and then trying to find a way to link those business transactions with his father, either through his brother, either through other business associates, uh, using uh, communications that may have had that uh, could vaguely be uh, connected to his father or, uh, you know, insinuating that his father was involved in it. And and each and every time Hunter Biden is asked about any sort of link to his father, he flatly denies under oath mm. that his father was ever involved in any of his business practices. And, you know, for the most part, Hallie, it's important to point out that most of these witnesses have backed up those claims by Hunter Biden, that his father was never involved in his business activities, save for one. And that's Tony Bobulinski, uh, who is someone that Hunter Biden had kind of an on and off business relationship with and someone that he eventually fell out with. And now Tony Bobulinski has become somewhat of the star witness witness for Republicans who has specifically said that he thinks that President Biden was involved in Hunter Biden's business dealings. And this is what Hunter Biden said in this deposition about Tony Bobulinski. And that's why I think Tony is a bitter, bitter man that did not get in on a deal that he wanted to get in on because I thought, and this is Hunter Biden speaking, that he was both incompetent and an idiot. And he's proved himself to be so by the complete misstatements that he's made. So this is an effort by Hunter Biden to truly undermine the testimony of Tony Bobulinski uh, and suggest that at uh, very early on in their business relationship, he deemed him to be someone that was not trustworthy and even kind of sort of admits in the, the deposition that he believes Bobulinski was trying to trade on Joe Biden's name. But that was one of the reasons that he disassociated himself with Bobulinski and that the statements that Bobulinski has made since are not to be trusted. That's at least Hunter Biden's side of this uh, story. Of course, Hallie, that's just scratching the surface of this six hour deposition, which we're just now getting the chance to read in on. Big picture, though, Ryan, what does this mean for the impeachment inquiry against President Biden? Well, you know, I spent a good portion of today talking to Republicans, uh, first of yeah. all, about the, the deposition and about whether or not they think the impeachment inquiry uh, could go forward. The first thing I discovered is that many of these Republicans, some of them who sit on these two committees, told me that they don't really see any value in bringing Hunter Biden uh, to testify in public. And that's pretty remarkable, given how much they insisted that that happen. But then secondly, uh, many of these same Republicans, many of them whom actually believe that the president should be impeached, believe that it's got absolutely no shot of actually happening. Uh, mm. There were uh, three different Republicans that I spoke to today who all told me that they do not think that the President Biden will ever be impeached. Two of them said they should have the vote, but the vote will fail. One of them said they shouldn't even go forward uh, with it. Uh, and, you know, that is kind of the, the growing sense that you're getting, that this impeachment inquiry is stalled, and there's nothing about this Hunter Biden uh, deposition that's going to change that.
Ryan Nobles, live first there on the Hill, following a lot of different threads. Ryan, thank you very much for bringing us that late-breaking development, and I appreciate it. Let's take you over to the Pentagon, where the Secretary of Defense, boy, fireworks on the Hill for him, with lawmakers confronting him over why, when he had his treatment, his surgery for cancer, and went back in the hospital, why didn't he tell the White House about it for a couple of days? Listen. Are you surprised the president didn't call for your resignation? I'm surprised, but are you surprised that he didn't call for your resignation? The president has expressed, expressed full faith and confidence in me. The big issue for me here is either the president is that aloof or you are irrelevant. Wh which one is it, Mr. Secretary? That, you would go three, that the president would go three days without knowing that his secretary of defense is, is not on the job? It, it's neither. It's neither, he says. Remember, Secretary Lloyd Austin was hospitalized and treated for prostate cancer. Uh, he had a procedure before Christmas. Then he went into the hospital on New Year's Day because he had some pain from it. He was going through a lot of issues. The White House wasn't told about that until January 4th, three days later, with the defense secretary now in and out of treatment, facing a ton of questions about how this absence could have affected national security. Courtney Kuby is joining us now live from the Pentagon. And Courtney, Listen, one of the things that you and I talked about back when this was happening, a month and a half ago, two months ago now, was how Lloyd Austin is a very private person. Mm -hmm. But the position that he is in, to some degree, forces um, a level of sort of public awareness because of this issue of national security, right? Like, walk us through that, because it came up a couple of times today. Yeah, that's right. And you may remember that a few weeks ago, he actually did a briefing here in the Pentagon where he talked about when he got that diagnosis, he called it a gut punch. And he said his first inclination was just to keep it quiet, to hold that information tight. And he didn't even want to tell anyone about it because he didn't want to burden other people with it. Well, I mean, in sort of a, a true twist of irony here, his decision very early on not to tell anyone about it has really led to this massive amount of disclosure that he's had to make in the form of briefings. Now this two hours of testifying today. But you're right. That, the major uh, so point of contention today was exactly why was it that not only Secretary Austin, but really more his staff here at the Pentagon, why did they not feel it necessary to notify the White House and President Biden of Secretary Austin's hospitalization for three days? And I got to tell you, Holly, we did not get an answer to that. We saw mm. a lot of testy, fiery back and forth, like the one that we just showed you just showed here on the show. Um, but we had a very consistent message out of Secretary Austin, and that was accepting responsibility, acknowledging that the notification process wasn't, didn't, didn't, wasn't handled correctly, but also reiterating over and over that the command and control process here at the Pentagon was never, um, was never in any jeopardy. Here's how, how he said it today. Again, we did not handle this right, and I did not handle it right. As you know, I've apologized, including directly to the president, and I take full responsibility. So the one thing that really stood out to me, though, Hallie, was today for the first time we heard Secretary Austin on several different occasions say that he expected or assumed that his staff would make those proper notifications, including to the agencies around town. But again, at the end of the day, he kept taking responsibility and said, we made mistakes, Hallie. Courtney QB, live for the Pentagon. Lots on that front. Court, thanks so much. Thanks. So listen, you're about to see the moment that the House officially kicked a potential government shutdown to another day. Look at this. On this vote, the yeas are 320, the nays are 99. Two-thirds being in the, the affirmative, the rules are suspended, the bill is passed. In plain English, in human speak, that is the House deciding, you know what, actually, we are not going to deal with this today. Pushing the deadlines again. You see the big X's there on the original deadlines, including one of them tomorrow at midnight. Now we're talking March 8th, March 22nd, when we're going to need to see a longer-term deal with the House Speaker, Mike Johnson, promising to slash the budget. Look, the appropriation, appropriations process is, is ugly. Democracy is ugly. Um, this is the way it works every year, always has. There will be uh, real cuts to uh, non-defense uh, discretionary spending because that's what was agreed upon and that's what we're going to adhere to. We are just learning, in fact, that the Senate is apparently going to vote tonight on the series of those essentially can-kicking plans to try to extend these deadlines here, again, to March 8th and March 22nd. We'll see how that goes later on tonight. It's expected to pass. Of course, before that deadline, tomorrow. More to come here on the show, including thousands of doctors in South Korea kind of facing an ultimatum tonight after going on strike. What the government there says could happen if these docs don't go back to work. 
Plus, what one of the country's biggest movie chains says is driving pretty much all its revenue this year. It's not the Kidman commercial. More on that in just a sec. Over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, we told you about that police lockdown of Maryland's State House in Annapolis in just the last hour or so. We're now learning from police it was because of a threat that was phoned in. Officers evacuated the building, but so far they say nothing has been found and nobody's been hurt. Number two, a new proposal from the Biden administration would make it easier for the government to fine airlines over how they handle wheelchairs. It would make damaging or misplacing wheelchairs illegal. It would also give training every year to airline workers who handle them. The DOT says airlines mishandled more than 11,000 wheelchairs and scooters just last year. Number three, Netflix might raise prices again this year, not according to Netflix, but according to analysts who are watching the whole thing. The company boosted the price of its basic plan from 10 bucks a month to 12 last fall. Netflix itself has not confirmed their hiking prices, but executives have said it is not off the table. Number four, Caitlin Clark, the superstar at the University of Iowa, says she's taken her talents to the WNBA draft. It's coming up in just a couple months. She is, I mean, you, I know you know who she is because she's the all-time NCAA women's scorer. She may, in fact, break the men's record this weekend. She says, it is impossible to fully express my gratitude to those who have supported her basketball journey. The draft is going to happen mid-April after the end of the college basketball season. She is legend already. It's going to be fun to watch her pro career, too. Number five, you know that iconic Nicole Kidman ad at the start of every AMC movie? Guess what? Tomorrow, AMC is going to release three new ones, man. Get ready. Get ready for some new Nicole. A lot of AMC news tonight, gang. What do you, what do you think Nicole Kidman's going to say in the new ads? Coming up. An American ballerina detained in Russia who just got her appeal denied. But her boyfriend is now telling our team tonight. Plus, one city in Bolivia declared a disaster zone after deadly flooding. What's making evacuations so difficult? New questions tonight on a chaotic attack in northern Gaza with at least 100 people killed, 700 more hurt while waiting for food, according to a spokesperson for Gaza's health ministry. Israeli troops, we're going to show you here, putting out this aerial video you're looking at, showing the attack, showing the panic with people surrounding an aid truck when gunshots started going off. Back here in Washington, President Biden acknowledging this deadly violence will complicate talks to pause fighting and get the 130 hostages being held currently out. Listen. Hope springs eternal. I was on the telephone with the people in the region. I'm still, probably not by Monday, but I'm hopeful. I want to bring in Raf Sanchez now, who's live for us in Tel Aviv. Talk through what we're learning about the attack here, what Israel says about why it happened, and why this is so complicated to begin to untangle. So, Hallie, Israelis and Palestinians giving two very different accounts yeah. of what happened. Here's what we know for sure. Starting at around 4 a.m. this morning, hundreds of Palestinians gathered on Al Rashid Street. This is a coastal road in Gaza City. And they were waiting at an aid distribution point, hoping to get some food, hoping to get some flour. The U.N. says one in four Gazans are just a step away from famine at this point. A Palestinian eyewitness says that Israeli forces at a checkpoint started shooting at that crowd before any of the trucks arrived and then continued shooting later as the crowd surged towards those trucks. As you said, the Palestinian Authority it says more than 100 people were killed. Hospitals in northern Gaza flooded with gunshot victims. The Israeli military is telling a different story. They are saying most of the dead were killed in a stampede in the chaos around the trucks. Some of those people may even have been run over by the trucks themselves. And they're saying their forces opened fire only at a very specific group of people who were threateningly approaching their position. Now, I asked an Israeli military spokesman earlier, do you have any evidence to support that claim that your forces were being threatened? Any drone footage, any head cam footage? They said they had nothing to provide at this point. As you heard the president say, he fears, other fears, that this will complicate what were already very difficult ceasefire 
ceasefire negotiations, negotiations that, Hallie, at this point appear to be basically stalled. If there is any cause for optimism right now, it is that the last ceasefire deal back in November was also negotiated during a period of pretty intense bloodshed in Gaza. That said, this is a much bigger deal. It is a much more complicated deal, and it is not clear right now if the two sides can come together and get it done. Hallie. Raf Sanchez live for us in Tel Aviv. Raf, thank you. To Russia now, where a Siberian court is denying an American ballerina's appeal of her detention on charges of treason. Ksenia Karolina wanted the court to replace her detention with house arrest, but turns out she's going to have to stay behind bars until at least early April. Karolina, remember, is accused of treason for donating just about $51 to Ukraine and posting messages against the war, according to Russian state media. She faces up to 20 years in prison under Russian law. Kier Simmons is joining us now. You are just hearing now from Carolina's boyfriend. What's he telling you? Yeah, that's right. I mean, this is another uh, depressing example, isn't it, Halley, of uh, an American citizen held uh, in Russia. Uh, Kesnia Karolina learning today that she is going to be held for another month. And I suspect, given the other examples, that it will be longer than that. And, and that's what her boyfriend, who we spoke to in L.A. In LA today after the decision that her appeal would be rejected, that's what he is having to come to terms with. He's told us about her condition, where she is being held, that, for example, she only is able to shower once a week. Take a listen. And I didn't get my hopes up. I knew this was going to be just like we're going to need a miracle. Um, but I was so sad to know that Ksenia has to go back there. And um, that's painful. A $51.80 donation. And I still can't wrap my head around it. I, I it, it, For her to be where she is because of a simple donation, because she's kind, you know, I, I'm battling with it to understand this. And Ali, I asked him what his message would be to President Putin, and he said she's innocent, she's mm. not a politician, uh, and uh, she doesn't deserve to be to be in prison. And it's happening on the same day as Putin himself is issuing, you know, this, this, I don't want to say new warning to the West because it echoes what he's been saying for a long time, right? He wants the West to stay out of the way of his invasion of NATO, uh, his invasion of Ukraine, I should say. Yeah, I, I mean, but it actually comes, uh, Halley, uh, after President Macron of France suggested in a speech and stunned many people, made many headlines, suggesting that there could be NATO boots on the ground inside Ukraine. Uh, by the way, there's now an argument between Germany and France and the UK after the German Chancellor suggested that there were uh, French and British soldiers in Ukraine already. And then you have President Putin today. And I mean, all of this just underscores, I think, uh, Frankly, what diplomatic, what diplomatically is a real mess over Ukraine right now. Uh, you now have President Putin effectively warning of a nuclear war if what President Macron says he thinks might happen did happen. And now we have the State Department weighing in. Take a listen. Well, it is not the first time we have seen irresponsible rhetoric uh, from Vladimir Putin. It is no way for the leader of a nuclear armed state to speak. Uh, we have communicated in the past privately and directly with Russia about the consequences of the use of a nuclear weapon. Um, that said, we do not have any sign that Russia is preparing to use a nuclear weapon, and we will continue to monitor this carefully. And Hallie, President Putin, in that speech, uh, celebrating, if you like, uh, success on the battlefield by the Russians, although, frankly, the front lines have hardly moved uh, in recent months. Uh, and talking about uh, Russian soldiers going through the, this is his words, going through uh, the furnace of war. Remember, once upon a time, he wouldn't even call it a war. Keir Simmons, live for us uh, from London with a lot of news to cover from that region. Keir, thank you. NBC News covers hundreds of other international stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our teams around the world have done it for you. Here's a look at what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. Out of Bolivia, disastrous floods, deadly floods, killing at least 40 people, forcing hundreds of families to evacuate this area. You see it here in the Amazon, dozens of homes underwater, people using boats to get around, some people trying to get away, running into some trouble because the international bridge between Bolivia and Brazil is also nearly covered with water from a nearby river. 
out of South Korea now. It is Friday morning there, and that means that it is past a government deadline for junior doctors to go back to work. If they don't show up, their medical licenses could end up suspended. They could even face prosecution as soon as next week. Remember, we told you about it. Thousands of medical interns or residents walked off the job more than a week ago, protesting the government's push to boost med school enrollments. And out of Italy, Pope Francis, he is back in meetings today after a whole bunch of medical checks yesterday. Remember, he's 87. He's been dealing with the flu. Holy week, his busiest time of the year is only about a month away. Coming up here on the show, a huge investigation by the New York Times showing just how dangerous some of these child influencer social media accounts can be for kids. But the reporter behind the story says surprised her most. Next in tonight's Backstory. Time now to get the backstory, our behind the scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. And tonight, we're looking at a huge investigation from the New York Times about the rise in popularity of younger girl influencers with social media accounts managed by their parents. These accounts apparently also drawing some pedophiles. And the Times says on some of these accounts, parents actively encourage male admirers, sometimes even sell them pictures, the paper says. Reporting from the Times that speaks to just how dangerous the world of child influencing can be for tweens at a time when a third of preteens want to be influencers. We should note Meta told our team that parents or managers are responsible for the accounts and their content and could delete them anytime. The same thing they told the Times. Let's bring in now Jennifer Valentino DeVries, the New York Times reporter with this story. Jen, we're so glad to have you on, especially given the depth of what you've reported here with you and your team looking at thousands of accounts. At one point in this piece, you write that it's showing disturbing insights into how social media is reshaping childhood, especially for girls with direct parental encouragement and involvement. People can see it there on screen. So it's just a huge investigation. So where did the reporting start for you? What was the impetus for this? So unbelievably this actually started before the pandemic. My colleague wow. on this piece, Michael Keller, and I were looking into um, how social media might be affecting young girls and started doing searches on, on social media platforms of things like tween influencers, you know, to see just how this massive, expanding influencer culture might be trickling down to the younger set. And we were finding all of these accounts that um, were run by parents. I had no idea until we looked at this that there could even be such a thing as a tween influencer. And, you know, we pitched this story and then um, I was just looking at one of our, our pitches and it was in you know January, February of 2020. And I think we all know what happened immediately after that. So um, there was a lot of news intervening in the meantime. And finally, we were able to pick it up again last year and, and look into this because we still felt it was really important. It's incredible to hear how long this was in the works, right? Whether it was front burner or back burner. How did you keep track of all of this? Because there were so many accounts. There were, I know, a lot of interviews, a lot of sort of background you had to gather, all that material. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it was just um, a massive undertaking. We used a lot of... Uh, Google spreadsheets and a lot of file folders on our computers. Um, and, you know, I think that was one of the big tasks we had was just keeping this organized. But it was so important for us to really get the full scope of what was happening rather than just trying to rely on talking with, you know, one or two people. As you talk about these conversations, um, I know you talk to parents who run these accounts, and one of them, one mom told you in a comment that our team really picked up on, um, she said she fed a pack of monsters. That's how she phrased it to you. She said that her daughter has written herself off and decided that the only way she's going to have a future is to make a mint on OnlyFans. She has way more than that to offer. That's a quote there. Was it that kind of thing? Was it a comment like that that surprised you most in the course of your reporting? Or, or was there anything that you reported out that really shocked you about this? You know, I think a lot of this was surprising. And I, I think that was some of it. And she was not at all the only parent who had been doing this for some time who expressed some sort of regret um, for at least part of what had happened and who told us um, that now that they had been through this, they did not think that children should be on social media in this way at all. Um, you know, I think that I was surprised that honestly there are still accounts like this being opened all the time. You know, it was difficult mm. to keep track of just new accounts um, 
and people coming into this world. And I think a lot of parents think that um, they're going into this and influencer culture is really normalized, especially among Generation Z. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think some people are just really not aware of, of how difficult it is to keep kids safe on these platforms. Well, that brings us to the accountability factor, right? Not just for some of these parents, but these social media companies. And that's a, another huge part of this. Did you find that as you were trying to get answers on that front, that these companies were responsive to this, to the parents, to your questions? You know, I think that um, the largest player here is Meta, um, mm -hmm. because this world that we found is really on Instagram, this particular world, um, partly because that's where the brands are. Um, these kids are really, they're representatives for brands that make things like leotards and children's dance outfits. Um, and those players really want to be on Instagram because that's easier for them. Um, and. You know, I think that when we were talking with these, um, the brands and with Meta, the response was not entirely satisfying. You know, some brands really worked to keep their followers clean but had a hard time, and others, I think, just kind of threw their hands in the air, and it was just, they found it so difficult. Jennifer Valentina DeVries, thank you so much for giving us a look sort of behind the scenes at what goes into a piece like that, one that I encourage folks to read, of course, on the site. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Lots more to come here on the show, including everything you ever wanted to know, but we're terrified to ask about why today is actually February 29th. What? Stay with us. In case you haven't noticed, it is Leap Day, and while that may seem like any other ordinary 24 hours, there's actually a lot of science to this, a lot of history. You curious about it? Harry Smith explains in tonight's breakdown why the world would look and feel a whole lot different without it. Yahoo! It's Leap Day, that extra day in February that lands on our calendars once every four years. It means deals on donuts and fast food. It commemorates the life of St. Oswald, who died about a thousand years ago and was famous for building monasteries. We take it you know about the Earth's annual trip around the sun. Takes a year, right? Well, it really takes 365 and one quarter days. And you're starting to think, come on, no one said anything about math. Well, tough. The trip takes 365 days, 5 hours, 48 minutes, and 46 seconds. And if we didn't add a day every four years, then after a half dozen centuries or so, summer would turn into winter and winter would turn into summer, giving a whole new meaning to Christmas in July. When the ancient Egyptians began measuring time by dividing the year into 12 months of 30 days, they added the five extra days onto the end of the year as five days of festivals. Party on, Pharaoh. But seriously, to be a leap year, the year number must be divisible by four. Easy peasy. But that 365 day, five hour and 48 minutes and 46 seconds times four only adds up to an extra 23.2 hours, not a full 24. So what is a world to do as all those leap days pile up? We occasionally take out some leap days. We only get a leap day in end of century years that are divisible by 400. So, for instance, the year 2000 was a leap year, but the year 1900 was not. Got it? Me either. For all you celebrating February 29th as your birthday, you are special. Think of it this way. All the kids you went to school with, kids from your grade, when they turn 100, you'll be 25, give or take a couple of minutes. Our thanks to Harry Smith for that one. That does it for us for this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.